And you have been watching a CBS News special report. Hurricane Ian has officially made landfall on Florida's west coast. Experts call this the worst case scenario for the state of Florida. There are two factors at play, the wind and storm surge, which is already as high as 10 feet in some places. The storm is massive, impacting half of the entire state. CBS News correspondent Chris Van Cleve joins us with more from Tampa. Chris, as we have been yep. checking in with you throughout the day, we've seen how quickly it seems like the weather has changed. What is the experience like right now? Uh, we're getting a lot of rain now. Um, you know, the, the wind is, is not terrible, uh, but the rain has really picked up. And, you know, we're still seeing water come out of Tampa Bay getting sucked into this storm. And it raises the question, uh, when is it coming back? And is that going to be gradual? Is that going to be all at once? What is that experience going to be like? And, and of course, how much rain will uh, this region actually get? You know, the, the forecast puts anywhere from 10 to, in some places, 20 inches of rain. Uh, it's just a, a mind-boggling <coughs> amount of rain in a 24-hour period. Uh, so right now, we, uh, you know, we're watching this storm as it comes ashore south of where we are thinking about the folks in the Fort Myers area. And we know that that storm is going to come this way. It, it won't get here immediately, but, uh, you know, we're feeling the winds pick up. We're seeing the rain pick up. Uh, you know, Ian is bearing down on western Florida, southwestern Florida. And, and so, Chris, now that we know, just to reiterate for our viewers, that Ian has landfall. made landfall around Fort Myers. Uh, have you sensed any different there, any difference there in Tampa? Of course, you are north, so uh, not bearing the brunt of this. But have you sensed any difference to the weather there? Well, you know, we've we've got enough difference where the, the where we're not going to feel the impacts that they're feeling. Uh, when the storm gets uh, up here, it's going to be different, but it's going to take it some time to get here. So, you know, we expect the conditions here to deteriorate throughout the evening. Um, as, as Ian works its way north. Uh, the, the other thing is the storm's slowing down. So it's going to slow down and dump a ton of rain. Uh, we're certainly seeing that. What we're not seeing is the level of storm surge that uh, some parts of the Gulf Coast are, are possibly going to get. When you're talking about 10, 12, 16, even 18 feet of storm surge, we're not likely to see that here in Tampa. You know, up until 36 hours ago, the real concern was that Tampa was going to take a direct hit, be at the center of this storm. The storm wobbled and it shifted south. Uh, and that, that came as a bit of a surprise to some folks. So, you know, that's uh, one of the dangers of these storms is, you know, we've got it. We've got that cone. And just because the, the middle of the line puts it somewhere doesn't mean that's where it's coming ashore. Yeah. yeah and so many times we hope that uh, <clears throat> that it will dissipate, that it'll lose some strength. But in this case, that hasn't happened. You've covered a lot of these storms in the past, Chris. How does this compare to others that you've experienced? You know, the, the two similarities are Charlie almost 20 years ago, which I didn't cover, and then Irma, uh, which I did cover for CBS. We were in Fort Myers, and that was another storm that was barreling in on Tampa. And then it shifted, and then Fort Myers was in the bullseye. And then it shifted a little bit more, and that little bit more, that like 20-mile wobble, pushed it into the Everglades and moved the most severe storm into an area where that was sparsely populated. Mm -hmm. Fort Myers got lucky in 2017. Uh, unfortunately, Ian is is their storm now. Yeah, that is definitely unfortunate for for the residents of Fort Myers. All right, Chris Van Cleve, thank you so much for that. Please do stay safe. Let's bring in CBS News meteorologist David Parkinson now. David, of course, you've been following the track of the storm very, very carefully. Can you tell us exactly where it is now that it made landfall? Yeah, we can, actually. So let me give you the uh, update from the National Hurricane Center. It came in at 310, and the official landfall time was 305. That's uh, what we have, but it was um, Cayo Costa was the location. Now, that is just uh, so in case you know that area geography, but you don't know where that that uh, particular island is. It is one north of Sanibel and Captiva. It is one south of, of where the Gasparilla Club is, if you know where that <laughs> location is. So uh, that is where the landfall location was, winds of 150 miles an hour. So it Ooh. did barely weaken. Uh, coincidentally, by the way, that is the exact same landfall wind speed as Charlie. But the huge difference between this storm and Charlie is, look at how massive this thing is. The eye is 40 miles across. The hurricane force winds are 80 miles across. And the tropical storm force winds go far beyond that. So the impacts that you're going to be dealing with with this storm and how long really set this apart from Charlie. So there's a lot of, of people who were around for Charlie 
um, and got very lucky that the size of that storm was so small. They are not so lucky this time, unfortunately. Wow. We keep hearing those Charlie comparisons, and it doesn't bode well. Right, and this one is so huge, mm -hmm. as you as you've mentioned. We've seen those images from space. We've seen the the um, the lightning that's been happening in there. For people who are watching this, who who aren't uh, as well read in as you are. Um, in the eye of the storm, there's going to be a calm period, and then what happens? The, the worst weather you can possibly have. So basically, you're going to have, on one side of the eye, really bad conditions. You're going to have a bit of a break. Now, the eye is a little bit uncleared out, so it is possible that you don't have that you know, blue sky where you see the birds above you. Um, and then, on the other side, you're going to have just rain at rain rates that most people have never seen in their lives. And you're going to have wind coming down at, you know, 130, 140, 150 mile an hour wind gusts. So um, that brief bit of calm belies what's about to happen to you. And the real concern here is there are so many facets to this. So you've got the heavy rain, you've got the storm surge, you've actually got a, a severe weather threat, you've got the risk of tornadoes along the space coast, and then all of this is going to move inland and track upwards. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, the two main threats are the wind at 150 miles an hour and the storm surge, certainly. Uh, but the foot of rain or the foot and a half of rain that goes into Orlando, mm -hmm. uh, there's just nowhere for the, that ground to take that as well. So you're going to see lots of freshwater flooding. You're going to be seeing lots of water into people's basements and things like that if you have a basement. Um, you know, there's lots of threats still ahead. Now that we've made landfall, uh, we're not even, I would say, to be frank, and this is really unfortunate, half over with the worst of the storm. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, if we could get a sense of the timeline here, because it's making landfall, so obviously it's, those are very dangerous conditions right now. You said there'll be a little bit of a calm if the eye of the storm passes over. Uh, and then the other side of the storm comes. How long will that portion last? So if, if you think about it, right, if the storm's moving northeast, northeast at about nine miles an hour, you have potentially two or three hours of calm. But mm -hmm. then you have a good probably two or three hours of the worst band. But then mm -hmm. look at these continuing bands around the outside of it. And then you got the feeder bands way beyond it. But all of these particular bands give you those, you know, rainfall rates that are two, three hours. You've got wind gusts 70, 80, 90, 100 miles an hour, even though you're not right on that central eye wall. Right. So, you know, we have documented wind gusts so far of 122 miles an hour. I suspect you will find stronger ones still to come as we get more data in. Uh, but then, you know, all of this still pinwheels around. Right. And then I want to show you up here, Daytona is starting to get into the rain. This band that's here is going to move up in that direction. So if you think about it, right, everything is going to continue to move up this way. And so it's all going to sort of pinwheel around the storm. And so, again, that's what's bringing in the storm surge. But it's also bringing in these feeder bands. Mm -hmm. And it's also bringing in this rainfall threat for this I-4 corridor. That Just is the area the whole that state. I'm most concerned about as night falls, because all of this rain is going to happen in the pitch dark of night. And then if anybody's out on the roads, if anybody starts to have some, some flooding and they think that they need to get out, they're not going to be able to see if there's a tree down. They're not going to be able to see if the roads are flooded. Um, and so nighttime flooding is, as we went through with uh, Ida here in New York, it is the most Deadly kind of flooding that you can have in the most devastating. Don't have to be out. Don't be Don't. out. Correct. Absolutely. Try to stay inside. But, but David, how long then is the danger of the surge? How many days after the pinwheel has passed an area could the surge follow? Um, so it's this high tide cycle and the next high tide cycle I'm most concerned about, though this high tide cycle will probably be the worst, but it's just not going to get to drain. And then eventually the storm will be here. And then again, if I, I show you the direction of things, right, it's coming around. So eventually you know, you're going to start to see it push out as the storm, you know, moves around this way. You know, it's, again, the same sort of situation. But here's the thing that I want to point out. Take a look at where the center of this storm is. Now you've got a surge going into Savannah. Now you've got a surge going into Charleston. Now you've got a surge going into Wilmington, North Carolina. So the sur surge threat, which, by the way, there are storm surge alerts all the way up and down the coast from Flagler County uh, up into Georgia and South Carolina, all of those you really need to watch out for because the storm is not done there, even though the wind, right, the wind will dissipate as it moves inland, uh, the rain rates will dissipate, but you've still got enough oomph with this storm to bring all of this uh, storm surge up into the coast. But as you can see, this is where you're starting to see some of the, at this time point, you know, 9, 10 o'clock at night, and then as we go into the overnight hours, look at where the, the wind streams are coming down. Now they're starting to push things out. 
And that's what, what you need to start emptying some of these bays and out. And David, because it's so big, and we know a lot of those resources, the emergency resources, the, the power restoration crews, have all been stationed to the north of this storm. Mm -hmm. But they can't get in until, really, those winds die down, until those th the th severe yeah. threats uh, have passed. How long might that take? I, I think daybreak, realistically, you're going to be able to see crews get out on the road. Frankly, that's what we're waiting for for our crews. We're gonna, we know that you know, Manny is, is the only one that we were able to safely put down there. Mm -hmm. You know, what we have to do, um, you know, our responsibility to our fellow journalists is to make sure that they get to go see their family at the end of the storm. Right. Um, so we don't right. want to put them in any place um, that could jeopardize that. So, you know, Manny, we were quite confident that he's in a very fortified, I mean, that building is a fortress. Right. Uh, but the rest of our crews, once the, dam the threat passes tomorrow morning, then we can go down there and tell everyone the picture of that. We can start documenting the stories of people, you know, helping neighbors and, and doing rescues and things like that. But, you know, tonight is not the night when you'll be able to do that, even though you'll be out of the rainfall in some of those southern places by about 10, 11 midnight. Well, quickly, David, just to wrap up, life-threatening conditions, though, will continue at least for the next 24 to 48 hours? I, I would say the next 24 hours are the most dire, okay. um, particularly for the amount of flooding that we're going to be seeing and some of the storm surge. And then things weaken, but you can't let your guard down because the storm is now going to be moving up here. You'll still have the potential for tornadoes. This happens all the time, by the way. The storm comes up into the Carolinas, and then you get spin-up tornadoes in the mid-Atlantic. Um, you get them in the Carolinas as well. So the storm threat is not over, but I would say it begins to diminish after tonight. Right. David Parkinson, right. thank you so much. Sure really thing. appreciate it. We're going to take a short break, but our coverage of Hurricane Ian continues right here on CBS News.